today on Missing Link. What connects a normal alpine lake with blood? What do our red blood cells have in common with rice? Where's the connection between rice corns and chess? What is it that associates that strategic board game with turkey? There aren't any links? Oh yes, there are. You just have to look really hard. Missing Link. This is Lake Toplitz, a calm, very deep body of water in Austria. It may look tranquil today, but this secluded spot has been shrouded in dark secrets for the past 65 years. Let us return to the final days of World War II. Chaos rules with scattered German military units carrying out orders no one will remember the next day. Compromising remnants of the once so highly praised 1000 year Reich now have to disappear never again to see the light of day. And what better hiding place than the deep, dark lake? What's actually in the mysterious cases brought by SS troops to Lake Toplitz in early May 1945? German biologist Hans Fricker and his colleague Jürgen Schauer have spent years all over the world working in research submarines. Now Lake Toplitz is on their radar. Visibility in Lake Toplitz diminishes rapidly after only a few meters. Each of these hazardous expeditions in the murky depths requires the absolute focus of the researchers. With the help of their submarine, they're out to prove whether or not Lake Toplitz is indeed the devil's rubbish tip. The findings uncover banknotes and cases of well-preserved counterfeit money. There is also military equipment like bombs, mines and explosives. It's a veritable underwater scrapyard. Then Hans Fricker and Jürgen Schauer discover an intriguing metal case. The case, which was found at a depth of 80 meters where there is no oxygen, becomes the centerpiece of a crime story puzzle. Professor Fricker and Jürgen Schauer attempt to retrieve the case. Wondering where it originates from, all sorts of possible explanations run through their minds. Numerous transports were made into the Alps during the final days of the war. The heavy case is reluctant to leave its adopted home in the lake's tenacious sediments. The researchers carefully open the metal case in the no oxygen zone. The excitement here is linked to transport that left Belgrade in April of 1945 with documents from a Serbian bank and the local German military administration. The transport was headed to a destination near Salzburg, Austria. Some of the cases were said to have ID cards with information on Jewish-owned bank accounts and properties, all of which disappeared without trace. Is this one of those metal cases? The case is opened, revealing more or less nothing more than a large and heavy stone. A few scraps of paper, so small that they're illegible, also appear. So now the question is, why would someone go to the trouble of sinking a case full of paper weighted down with a stone in the deepest part of Lake Toplitz? And when? The scraps of paper reveal random bits of information such as 1942 and the name of Dash, a German spy sentenced to death in the USA. Other scraps contain drawings of cartoon-like stick figures. And then there's one particularly mysterious symbol. In the end, it's a car advert that finally sheds light on the mystery for Fricker. What he's found is an Austrian issue of the German magazine Stern from the 4th of January 1958. Fricker suspects that someone emptied the metal case in the post-war years. 
The sketched figures are in fact part of a cartoon. The mysterious symbol that Fricker initially thought was a rune turns out to be part of a caricature. What the faded handwritten number means remains a mystery. We met police and intelligence experts in Germany and Austria what they make of the Stern magazine. No one has been able to provide a plausible answer. We've also considered that the whole thing might just be a prank. But who transports a heavy case to an isolated spot on a lake to sink a magazine in the stone? No, that just doesn't make sense. The lake has since been examined with a fine-toothed comb. And one thing is now certain. There is no treasure awaiting adventure seekers here. These bags can save lives. With blood transfusions, it's crucial that the blood from the donor and the recipient are compatible. But what does this blood have to do with an alpine lake? Blood. During our whole lives, it courses through our veins. If it doesn't, we die. Precisely why it's so important. Blood, life and death, they all belong together. It's because blood plays such a central role in our lives that clinicians have dubbed it the liquid organ. Apart from the various functions it performs in our bodies, blood has another particular property. It's red. More precisely, blood red. And wherever this color appears, it evokes dubious associations. This is what happened at a small lake in Bavaria called the Alatsi. At first, it seems to be quite a normal lake, but at the depth of around 15 meters, its waters are blood red. It's down to this coloring that myths of bizarre stories abound. Among them are bloodthirsty fables about fishermen being drawn to their death in the depths. And it's their blood that colors the waters. Oh, absolute nonsense, of course. The lake is red because of purple sulfur bacteria that only appear red. And anyway, even if the lake really was full of blood, well, it shouldn't send shivers down our spine. Just think of all the happy blood banks there would be. Roughly six litres. That's the amount of blood flowing through the average adult's body. While it all looks the same, medical professionals classify blood on the basis of 29 properties the most important of which is the blood type. Almost no one knows their own blood type, a factor that can be of life-saving importance in an accident. Of course, it's extremely important then to know the victim's blood group, so that the right kind of provide it. It's essential in a transfusion that the donor's blood and the recipient's blood match. Otherwise, clotting occurs and red blood cells begin to burst. In the worst case, this can lead to death, so medical scientists have developed a number of systems for determining the correct blood type to minimize this risk. The most common of these systems is the ABO blood type system, introduced by Karl Landsteiner in 1901. This system revealed that red blood cells have certain protein molecules called antigens attached to their cell walls. People with A antigens in their cells are in the blood type A. The same applies for the blood type B and AB. If the subject has no antigens, that person is in blood type O. In Europe, in Europe the blood, blood types are distributed fatal, with a slight uh, predominance of type A, a over type O. The average, average is roughly 40%, type A percent, dominating at just over 40%, while type O is just under 40%. Type B has approximately 10%, and type AB around 5%. Another important protein molecule is known as the rhesus factor, which is found in roughly 85% of all Germans. Its presence means that a blood type is deemed positive. If the rhesus antigen is absent, the blood type is negative. The ideal blood donor is type O negative, because this type is compatible with every other blood type. O negative is known as the universal donor. The ideal blood donation recipient has blood type AB positive and can therefore accept any blood type. 
Die Blutgruppe 0 ist ein kostbares Produkt. Wir typo stellen im Prinzip mehr Konserven in Blutgruppe 0 her, als die Verteilung in Deutschland hergibt, weil wir immer wieder für die Notfälle Blut, der Blutgruppe 0 benötigen. Aber es ist ein kostbarer Saft. For years, scientists have dreamt of chemically produced universal blood. A group of Danish researchers have discovered bacterial enzymes that can separate all antigens from the cell walls. This means, for instance, that an elaborate process can turn type AB positive into antigen-free type O negative blood. But the process is still too expensive for mass application. Wir brauchen äh, in der Charité 60.000 blood bags every year at the hospital. Das sind riesen Mengen, ja. Da müssen sie also We need to treat all this blood. Dieses Blut blood is already expensive. Das so immens teuer. It would make it financially unfeasible. Das ist einfach nicht bezahlbar. Ne? The red blood cells can only be stored in the donor bags for a maximum of seven weeks, despite refrigeration and airtight packaging. Hospitals experience bottlenecks with their blood supplies during the summer holiday season, even though demand remains constant. Rice is the staple food for more than half the world's population. Rice was already being widely cultivated in Asia as far back as 5,000 years ago. But what does rice? to do with blood. Rice forms the staple diet for over 80% of the world's population. But it wouldn't be doing justice to rice to describe it only as stomach filler. Rice can look back on a long and illustrious academic history. From it we learn that those who eat only polished white rice fall ill. Those who eat natural rice enjoy better health. This led to the discovery of a pocket in the rice that contained vitamin B1. That was in 1912 and marked the start of vitamin research. Today, 100 years later, scientists once again have rice in their sights. This time, it's not vitamins they want to extract from it, but blood. Genetically engineered rice is capable of producing albumin, a protein found in blood. It's required in massive quantities the world over during medical interventions. Up to now, it's had to be extracted from donated blood. But in the near future, it's not people who will be sourcing it, but cores of rice. This is the International Rice Research Institute, or IRI, in the Philippines. While the rice varieties handled here used to be predominantly high yield types, climate change now presents this research institute with new challenges. German researchers Rainer Wassmann and Sigrid Hoyer are busy developing rice varieties that can not only withstand the climate of the future, but also thrive. In the context of Asia, is rice Rice Asia, einfach viel rice zu wichtig, ist, dass man solche Risiken, die wir jetzt durch den Klimawandel haben, ignorieren könnte. Und von so daher müssen wir überlegen, wie die Probleme immer aussehen werden Cultivation und was wir von der Züchtung, weil das so ja auch eine gewisse Zeit fordert, dass wir jetzt schon daran arbeiten und jetzt schon überlegen, wie kann man unter zukünftigen Bedingungen auch die Reiserträge nachhaltig erhalten. So the question is, how will today's rice plants react to the temperatures of tomorrow? To find out the answer, the rice researchers grow the plants in climatic chambers. They want to know how the plants will develop under heat stress. Most high yield varieties blossom when the day is especially hot, between 11 a.m. and 12 noon. But when they blossom, rice plants are also very sensitive to heat. So can the researchers come up with a rice variety that blossoms early in the morning instead. The scientists have selected 4,000 rice varieties from the IRI gene bank and planted them in the test field. They are hoping that some of the more traditional varieties will blossom earlier than today's rice plants, meaning that they would be far more resistant to heat. Es ist sicherlich so, dass ähm, die, die modernen Varietäten äh, Toleranzgene äh, verloren haben, weil sie nicht gebraucht wurden. Das heißt, die, die Züchtung hat mehr darauf geachtet, dass die Qualität von dem Reis gut ist, dass der Hochertrag ist. Nicht so sehr darauf, dass es auch unter Stressbedingungen wachsen kann. Aber es ist jetzt zunehmend äh, wichtig, dass, dass wir Reis haben, der Multiresistenzen hat. Of the 4000 plants in the field, Three varieties blossomed earlier. But which rice gene is responsible for this? 
A new cultivation method allows Sigrid Hoyer to intentionally filter out the early blossoming gene, which she then crosses into a high yield variety later. Nothing else is changed about the recipient plant. The new rice first has to undergo complex testing, but the efforts seem to be paying off. Wenn man dann sieht, dass diese, diese Forschung ähm, direkt im äh, Feld äh, der, der Bauern endet und einen, einen wirklich ähm, äh, zur, zur Verbesserung der Lebensbedingungen von äh, Bauern äh, beitragen kann, das, das äh, ist eine große Motivation. Some 60% of all rice varieties originate from plants developed here. And a rice variety ready for the challenges of climate change, free from the burden of people, could be on the way soon. Chess is the world's most important board game. 1972 witnessed the most legendary chess match in history. But what's the connection between chess and rice? Chess, the game of kings. That's not just a trite saying, it's the truth. It's a fight between two kings with their vassals across the squared board to determine victory or defeat. OK, so you need two players to move the pieces, and they don't need to be kings. There's a legend though that a king himself played a not unimportant role in the introduction of chess. The wise inventor of chess showed it to his king, who was delighted and wanted to adequately reward the man. Rather than claiming gold and jewels, he made the following request. Oh, great king, give to me a corn of rice on one field, on the second field two, on the third field four, and let this doubling of rice corns continue until the 64th field. That is my humble wish. The king laughed and declared it would be no problem, and his officer of brains would deliver the sacks to him. But when the court mathematician potted it all up, the smile disappeared. On the 64th field, there would need to be more rice than had ever been harvested on Earth. Checkmate, muttered the king. Chess is called the game of kings. Its truly great players are viewed as geniuses and shrouded in myth. Chess is not about winning or losing, it's about surviving. Iceland, 1972. Reykjavik is playing host to the chess match of the century. Mr. Fisher, are you in the mood for the draw now? An American against a Russian, right in the middle of the Cold War. Mr. Spassky, are you feeling well for the championship? The hall, built especially for the event, holds 2,500 spectators. The whole world is anxious to know who the real world champion is in this game. Hier kam aber noch etwas dazu, der Nervenkampf. But there es was ging even also more nicht nur um eine ruhige, sachliche Partie, oder sagen wir mal, plus minus im the Bereich des Schachbretts, sondern es ging auch noch darum, den Gegner vielleicht psychologisch zu bekämpfen. Und das war der Gegner vielleicht psychologisch zu bekämpfen und zu besiegen. The Soviet Union, where chess was viewed as part of the ideological struggle, had dominated the chess world championships for decades. More than three million Soviet citizens were members of chess clubs. Successful players were permitted to compete in tournaments abroad and rewarded with special privileges. The chess world champion of the time is from Leningrad. Boris Spassky is not a member of the Communist Party. He plans to cream the competition at a chess match in Iceland. His opponent, Bobby Fischer, is an acknowledged genius who became the youngest chess international grandmaster at the tender age of only 15. An upright American, Bobby's only interested in two things, chess and money. And the top prize in Iceland is $250,000. Bobby Fischer is known for being difficult. He arrives a week late for the first match, complaining that the cameras bother him. The result is no cameras and no recording of the first round, which Spassky wins. And the psychological warfare continues. Spassky has to wait because Bobby Fischer simply doesn't show up for the second round. When einer nicht innerhalb einer Stunde eintraf, 
If one of the players fails to show up within an hour, then the round is forfeited. You lose that round without actually having played it. And Fischer didn't show up for the second game because he issued demands that were just unrealistic. Things about the cameras and so on. So I was faced with the most difficult decision of my whole life. I had to declare the game a forfeit for Bobby. It was awful. And it looked like the match was all over. Now the Russian had a two-point lead. The rumor mill started up quickly, declaring that Bobby Fischer was getting ready to leave secretly, the flight was already booked and so on. But suddenly he showed up the third game with new demands. He could only play in an adjacent room because the audience was too loud. The fate of the chess world championship was in the hands of arbiter Lothar Schmidt. I remember grabbing both men by the shoulder and pressing them down into their seats. Then came that first move the player seems to make by reflex when the game begins. Spassky opened with the queen's pawn. The game had started. And that was something of a miracle. This was the legendary third game which Fischer won playing black. It was a beautiful win. And it changed the trajectory of the whole match. The battle between Spassky and Fischer is watched worldwide, with people from New York to Moscow scrutinizing their every move. Not that the players themselves noticed much of the fuss. They were too busy slugging it out at the board. After the dramatic turn of events in the third game, Bobby seemed to develop superhuman powers. No one saw that coming. Boris Spassky threw in the towel after the 20th game, and Bobby Fischer was crowned the new chess world champion. Russian predominance in chess had been broken. It's a victory for the free world. Rush hour on the Bosphorus. Every day thousands of people cross the strait between Europe and Asia. Now a tunnel is being planned to ease the enormous traffic load. But building a tunnel is no mean feat in a region susceptible to earthquakes. And by the way, what do Turkey and Czechs have in common? Turkey is a country that lies between Europe and Asia, and rather unsurprisingly, it's the home of Turkish people. Hardly an earth-shattering realization. Less well known, however, is that 250 years ago, the Turks were believed to be particularly good at chess. This in no small way contributed to the development by Wolfgang von Kempelen in 1769 of his chess automaton. Seated behind a big chest in Turkish attire was a puppet that could play chess, or at least so it appeared. Amongst those who sought out his mechatronic master were Frederick the Great and Napoleon Bonaparte. Both of them, so to speak, met their Waterloo, the Temple Turk won. Only later did it come to light that the Turk was no mechanical wonder. It had all been a great illusion, a trick. Sitting in that big chest was a chess master operating the controls of the turban top dummy and the chess figures. Mechanical marvel, my God. It was just one big trick. Recording seismic waves. In regions like Turkey, with a history of earthquakes, constant measurement of these waves is part of a researcher's daily routine. And once again, the seismographs are busy. It takes five minutes for Dogan Kalafat and his assistant to pinpoint the epicenter. Earthquakes are their daily routine. The ground in Turkey quakes and rattles roughly 7,500 times a year. The location of this quake is also no surprise. It occurs in a special geological zone bordering the North Anatolian Fault. The country's strongest earthquakes of the last 100 years have occurred along this invisible line. The line's westernmost end is marked by Istanbul. And this is where a road tunnel is to be built. A quake like the one in Izmit would spell catastrophe for this bustling metropolis and its 4 million residents. And hundreds of thousands of those residents commute between Asia and Europe every day. The latest studies predict that an Istanbul quake would cause 50,000 deaths. Most of the losses would come in densely populated parts of the city, like Ushkodan. But this is precisely where a train station that's a major junction point of the new traffic management concept is being built. 
75,000 people are to be transported from Europe to Asia every hour. This is the vision of the tunnel planners. But construction has been stopped for now due to a severe structural analysis problem. Until the issue is resolved, the station will have to wait. Workers clear the critical spot in the sediment of this former harbour area. The problem becomes visible at a depth of five metres. No stable structure can be erected on this kind of substratum. Diese Erde hier the ist ground here weich. is quite soft, es nennt sich made up of both clay and loam. Boden. Besonders im Falle eines Erdbebens if a quake occurred, the whole kommen, station building could das sink into the Gebäude, ground. An earthquake could cause the loam underneath the station to simply squeeze out on the sides underneath it, leading the station building to tip over and sink into the soft substratum. It is the job of Serhat Memisholu and his men to prevent that. Massive cranes are now driving heavy drill piping into the ground. They are drilling hundreds of holes all over the construction site. Each of these holes is then filled with concrete, creating a network of concrete pillars in the ground. Together they form a foundation designed to make the new station earthquake safe. The soft clay and loam ground is perforated all around with concrete supports extending as deep as 50 meters into the earth. These supports prevent the station from sinking, even during a heavy earthquake. Still, these kinds of safety measures cause the costs for the tunnel project to explode. The tunnel is set to run a few meters underneath these houses in the heavily populated Istanbul district of Ushkadan. And the ground here is soft too. These problems represent extreme challenges for the engineers. This huge hole is the entranceway to the new train route. Shimizu Yoshizumi is the site manager for this section of the route, running 50 meters underneath the surface. His company has already built many tunnels in Japan. One particular requirement for the Istanbul tunnel is the reinforcement of the ends of the tunnel. Hundreds of steel supports stretch down 20 meters into the earth. To, uh, the laser for, uh, set, uh, We're stabilizing kind of the building with wall anchors. Uh, to get the stabilization of In the an earthquake, buildings wall. can slide With and fall down very easily. It can fall down very easily. Slide. Turkish companies don't have the experience to build such projects. So the planning for this massive tunnel is almost exclusively in the hands of Japanese companies. Earthquakes are a part of daily life in Japan, so the Japanese know that tunnels provide the best protection in an emergency. In the earthquake, the tunnels are rooted in the uh, earth and shake the evenly with there the ground a, around uh, them tunnel. when there's an earthquake. And in the earthquake, it shake together. Buildings, however, shake Not independently divided. of the ground but they stand on. Building is different. Building will shake itself. It's amazing to think that this audacious tunnel project could even protect the people of Istanbul during an earthquake. But first of all, 15 kilometers of the piping have to be laid. 